No, it is uh, good to be with you on a good Friday. Um, the issue of the uh, crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord, very, very important, obviously, to all Christians, central to our understanding of the faith. And I said yesterday uh, that, uh, oh, I didn't want to do that. Uh, hmm. Well, I guess I'm sort of stuck with it. Uh, I imagine that looks best on your side, huh? Yeah, unfortunately, it's put everything over there. I can't see anything on that side of the screen. Um, uh, I hadn't tested this, so let me let me uh, fix something here real quick um, and turn off the uh, turn off the presenter stuff uh, somehow. I'm not sure how to do that off the top of my head. Just looking at it. Uh, but I want to talk to you uh, about, there it is, the enable presenter display. There we go. Preferences. They're wonderful things. Let's see if it works uh, this time. No, it just blanks the other screen. <laughs> That's real helpful. Uh, <clears throat> I have a nice presentation here, uh, but it's going to blank out everything I have on the screen. So I, I may just blow it up. Uh, real big here and uh, let you mess with it from there if that's all right. Um, that way I can have the uh, uh, accordance uh, program uh, over here. There we go. Sorry about this, folks. I should have double checked all these things, but you know how it works. What? It, it's Friday. Okay, I'll leave it there. It's It's Friday. How can this be traditionally, or in reality, the date of the crucifixion. Jesus said he was a sign of Jonah. He would be in uh, the earth three days and three nights, and you cannot get three days and three nights out of Friday afternoon to crack a dawn Sunday morning. You, you, can't, you can't pull that off. Can you? And if you can, why would you? Why not just say it was Wednesday or at least Thursday and stretch it that far? And of course, there are lots of folks. Uh, this is the kind of internet thing uh, that gets passed around and people go, hey, I've never even thought about that before. And, and so it, 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 causes issues and and divisions and, and things like that. So I wanted to address the issue with you um, just for your own uh, edification and uh, consideration, and also because it is one of the standard arguments. In fact, the presentation I have is called Airman's Best. Um, I did this. My recollection is... I presented this somewhere in New York for Jeremiah Cry, and I don't remember what year it was. May have been 2012. I don't know. May have even been before that. I'm not sure. Um, but it was not too long after Bart Ehrman sort of stormed on the scene with his popular level books uh, going after the, the Christian faith. And so I was asked to, you know, address some of his best arguments. I'm not sure necessarily best as they would be most common or most frequently repeated, uh, because he does do that a lot in, in debates. He'll frequently repeat these things. And since this does require some level of knowledge of the Passover and Jewish practice, that's where the problem comes in, is... <laughs> the I I was the most awake, attentive, and alert student in the Old and New Testament backgrounds classes in seminary at, of anybody, and the reason was I was already involved with apologetics, and so while most everybody else was just like you know either nodding off wondering how is this ever going to be relevant to me if I go into the ministry uh, or working on papers due in another class. 
um, I was eating it all up because I recognized how important it was um, to to know this material, the background material, the contextual material, because so much of the argumentation that is used against the faith it draws from that uh, genre of information. Um, and since a lot of seminary graduates do sort of, you know, put that off. There's not really paying attention. It's not something they remember. That means it doesn't end up in sermons, which means it's not, it doesn't end up being communicated to the people. And that opens up a huge place for unbelievers, cultists and others, to drive a big old truck of unbelief right in the middle of our, uh, of our theology. Or if you want to use, hey, I just thought of something. If you want to use a Lord of the Rings analogy, this is this the classical literature here. Um, it's like at Helm's Deep um, when uh, that they they plant that explosive, and um, Legolas is trying to take down the 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 orc that has the 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 thing that's going to you know the fire that's going to blow it up, and he hits him but doesn't take him down. He dives in and boom blows it up. That that's that then allows the orc army to to get inside and um, to wreak havoc. And uh, so some of you are going, hey, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop listening to this guy now and go watch that again. <laughs> Just, you're, you're firing up, you're firing up your Apple TV right now and just gonna ignore everything else comes after this. It just, just, I can't stop you from doing that. Anyway, so with that in mind, um, I would imagine this is probably clear enough to, to read in a small screen, but, you know, we can blow it up or whatever. I'm sorry? Ah, there you go. Uh, let's see. Let me move this way a little bit. <laughs> go, go like that. Uh, okay, what's the assertion? The assertion is there is a fundamental clear contradiction without possible explanation between the synoptics and John as to whether John, Jesus ate the Passover and hence upon which day he was crucified, whether 14 or 15 Nisan. Now, of course, Nisan is not a um, um, Japanese-made uh, automobile or truck. Uh, I've owned a few Nissan trucks over the years. Uh, this is, of course, the month and, again, lunar calendar, therefore it moves back and forth, which you may have wondered, why can't we ever figure out where Easter is? Um, long history of that in the church, by the way, which we're not going to get into today, but a uh, long history of that in the church uh, concerning uh, how you figure out when uh, Easter is to be celebrated, and there was actually difference uh, between the East and the West on this subject. This is This is actually... It's called the quartadeciman controversy. If you want to, that'd be a really good Scrabble word, quartadeciman. Wow, that just wipe everybody right off the board with that one. Uh, that you just win the whole thing. Quartadeciman controversy. Uh, look it up sometime. It is, um, I think, very. Um, it shines a bright light into the into the second century context of what was developing at that time and what was important at that time. Things like that. But anyway. Uh, this is why the date changes is because of when Passover will be observed, and that's um, done on the basis of a lunar calendar, and so it'll uh, pop back into March eventually. You know, right now it's in April, and it, so it goes back and forth. So the argument that is being put forward, and you will find this in many books of theology once again, you buy a commentary on the Gospel of John or on the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And you will be told um, that, in essence, there is a um, historical problem here. That plainly and clearly, uh, John is seeking to make a theological point by changing history and saying that Jesus was actually crucified at the same time the Passover lambs would be being slaughtered. So that makes Jesus a Passover lamb, and behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And, and the whole idea is if John is willing to 
sacrifice history, then should we really be all that concerned about silly things like inerrancy and uh, contradiction and things like that? We should just let John be John, and John isn't giving us a strict history. And so that's why we don't really have to believe that um, the stuff that accompanied the crucifixion with Jesus is real, or the stuff that accompanied the crucifixion with Matthew is real. I mean, the, the uh, uh, you know, the zombie apocalypse, the zombie resurrection, uh, the dead coming out of the grave. We don't have to, you know, that, that had a certain point. We're not really sure what the point was, but it, it must have had some point to Matthew anyways. Uh, and so we don't have to worry about it, and it didn't really happen historically and, uh, and all as well. So this is what we are told, not only by Dr. Ehrman, but by many others, and that is that John and the Synoptics give a different day for the crucifixion of Jesus. Well, is that the case? Well, we know that the Passover lamb was slain on the afternoon of Nisan 14, the Passover feast, the, Passover, the, the feast of unleavened bread uh, began that day with the Passover meal that evening, the beginning of Nisan 15. Now, this is where background is important. Uh, Nisan 15 would begin at sunset. Begins at sunset. Um, there have been down through the centuries many different ways of figuring time, days, weeks, months, years. One of the most difficult studies in antiquity is looking at um, ancient documents and figuring out what year in the modern calendar that would have been. Because January to December, that's natural for us, but that's not how people have necessarily counted years in the past. In fact, it was more common to utilize the agricultural year and that calendar. And so begin the year in the spring or maybe at harvest in the fall or, or whatever. Uh, our solar calendar isn't even quite right. If you, if you want to, if you want to do a serious solar calendar, then you'd, you'd have it starting where the sun begins once well, the day begins to lengthen again. Right. If you could tell that, that would be the way to do it. But, the point is that um, ancient king lists, for example, had what were called accession years. Uh, so the the first full the first year of reigning would actually be in our reckoning the second year of reigning, and you, you start you start getting an idea. Man, if you're trying to correlate the Babylonians and the Egyptians and the Israelites and and all these ancient documents to figure out who was reigning when and how long they reigned. And, ooh, it, it gets ugly, really, really ugly. But in this instance, now we're talking about, well, when does the day begin? How many hours is the day? Uh, when does it start? And the Jews began uh, the day at sunset. So as, as the sun is setting, that's the end of the previous day. And so the day begins when the sun sets. That's the next day. So it goes from Nisan 14. So you would, uh, you would slaughter the, the Passover uh, sacrifice, uh, the Passover lamb, uh, on the afternoon. So in other words, right at the end of Nisan 14. And then the Passover feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasts for a week begins at sunset. And so you would then partake of that first meal of the entire feast. The feast is not a one-day thing. We, we tend to think of Passover, the Passover meal, as a singular thing because of what happened in, in Exodus. Because that's when the, that's when God strikes the firstborn dead and and all the other, other associated things, but it's a week, once it's established as a festival, it's, it's a week long. And so to eat the Passover is not just to eat the Passover first supper. That's very important, 
that sort of symbolizes the whole thing. And, and obviously, as Judaism has secularized uh, over the years, then what was once a week shrinks down to a day, just as the 12 days of Christmas are now basically about 12 minutes of Christmas until the packages are opened. And then well, here we go to the next year, right? Um, you know, this is really weird because I can't tell whether you're smiling or laughing or anything like that. So it's strange. Well, but my door's closed. So I'm, and the glass I'm sure is not permeable. So, um, anyway, okay. Uh, so, uh, I can't, I can't, and now I can't understand what you're saying either. So uh, I guess it doesn't matter. So keep that in mind. Two thing, a couple things to remember then is the Jewish day begins at sunset. And here's the big key. When the Jews are counting days, they count any portion of a day as a full day. So if you start, let's say at 3 p.m. our time, and count till just after sunset the next day. How many days is that? Three. The one, 3 p.m. to sunset one day. The next full day, you go past sunset to the next day. So um, any portion of a day is counted as a day in Jewish reckoning of days. So that will help. So, th so th those time issues and keeping in mind that the Passover is not a single meal. It is a week-long festival will help a lot with a lot of these things. So the synoptics all agree that on the first day of unleavened bread, Jesus sent Peter and John from Bethany to make preparation for eating the Passover meal. This is recorded for us in Mark and Matthew, and in Luke. And so, Jesus sends Peter and John, um, clearly then, in the synoptics, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus ate the normal Passover meal, and hence was crucified on Nisan 14. So you have the Passover meal, you have the establishment of the Lord's Supper, and... Uh, this then takes place in the evening, which is the beginning of Nisan 15, but the same day, so overnight, into, the, into what would be for us the next day, but it's just simply the continuation of Nisan 15. You have, you know, that evening you have the betrayal, the arrest goes all overnight, um, trial, running back and forth, Herod, Pilate, and then around noon, um, and then this is another thing. I forgot about something else here. Uh, there are multiple ways of counting hours at this time in history as well. And what I mean by that is um, when you say the sixth hour, for us, you're starting at midnight, so that'd be 6 a.m., but if you start at sunrise, that's no longer 6 a.m. That's noon. And the Jews and the Romans did this in different ways. Um, so because of the difference in how they handled this, uh, that explains some of the differences in how it's recorded. Because if you're writing, if you're writing for an audience that uses Jewish timekeeping, then that's going to be confusing for an audience that doesn't use Jewish timekeeping um, and vice versa. And so you, you immediately see that there are questions that are raised as to, well, how should you record these things? And we have to look at each one. When you look at the four Gospels and... Most people feel John is, is the last one written. 
And most feel John was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. It doesn't have to have been. But if it was, then it would be even more logical to use the Roman time system than the Jewish time system. Um, because of who you're writing to and who you're, the audience of your, of your work is going to be. And so that's important to keep in mind, too, as to whether it was, you know, what is the ninth hour? Um, the ninth is the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Well, if you started, if you start at 6 a.m. sunrise, yeah. If you start at midnight, then it's 9 a.m. in the morning. So it's going to be a six hour difference between the two. And you'll notice that there are differences. We're not so much concerned about that right now as, as another background thing to keep in mind. Uh, when you're looking at alleged contradiction, contradictions, you don't ever want to make the accusation of contradiction when the reality is it's just your own ignorance that is um, producing this. So, in the synoptics, Jesus eats the normal Passover meal and hence was crucified on Nisan 14, midday approximately, uh, for the sun to be darkened and things like that. Many scholars, including modern and mainly conservative scholars, have concluded that John has Jesus eat the Passover on Nisan 13, so that he is crucified at the same time as the Passover lamb on Nisan 14. And so they would see a day difference, and the day difference they would explain as a theological embellishment. It is meant to create a connection in the mind of the reader that, if we're honest, did not exist historically. Um, Jesus is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, therefore wouldn't it be wonderful if he's crucified at the exact same time as the Passover lambs were being crucified in, in Jerusalem? And so that's the idea. And even... And, of course, some people would dispute the use of the word conservative here. Um, but what would be generally considered conservative interpreters, um, you buy a commentary, you're going to run into this perspective. And some of those commentaries, honestly, will not even give space to what would be called a harmonization of the sources. You need to understand, I, 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 over the years, I've had lay people who have not had the opportunity of taking Bible college seminary have been assisted when I've pointed a sort of a, a fact out to them that they were not aware of. And that is that when you look at there is a, because in history, there have been periods of time when you weren't even allowed to question current narratives. You think of Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church and, and inquisitions and stuff like that. Because of that, um, people today... Do, do not feel like it's necessary to allow freedom for harmonization. You, you all already had your shot. That's considered fundamentalistic, simplistic, shallow. You're simply to accept as a given the presence of, well, when I was in seminary, at least they used the term, at least most of the professors used the term, tension in the text. That's their way of saying contradictions. And so the accepted scholarly way of dealing with this is to embrace the contradiction and to look for the deeper meaning of the contradiction. Okay, so that's really, really common. That's what's out there. And so you'll find people who you would think generally in other, word, other ways, are very conservative, uh, who will take this perspective, okay? So that's the idea 
Uh, so the spiritual way to look at it is John is making a spiritual point, and isn't it a beautiful spiritual point, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are five relevant passages in the Gospel of John to examine. Ehrman says that clearly, and since I put that in quotes, he must have said clearly. Clearly, John contradicts the synoptics, but is this so? John chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, is the quotation, and I stopped it there. It is assumed, on the basis of this being before the Feast of Passover, that this means that it was 24 hours before, that is 13 Nisan. But this requires us to read Feast of Passover as referring only to the initial meal, not to the entire celebration, which lasted an entire week. Instead, the text speaks of Jesus doing things during the supper, which is clearly the normal Passover meal. So one of the primary assumptions that has to be questioned and abandoned is that the Passover is a single meal. And isn't that how most people think of it? I mean, even if you have Jewish friends, what's, what, do you, what, what are you seeing right now on Twitter? People talking about what? The Passover Seder. Are you talking about something three days from now? No. So it was last night. So the Passover Seder was just one thing. Uh, Al Mohler was talking, uh, he read an art, well, read portions of an article this morning by an, a Jewish atheist, which is fascinating. I've met so many Jewish atheists. Um, and the idea was she participated in a quarantine Seder via Zoom with her family as an atheist because it made her feel good, even though she can't believe in a capricious God that would throw plagues around as if there is such a thing in the Bible. Of course there isn't, but that's a whole other topic. Um, the idea was this is the Passover. It, it, it was last night. And the next one's going to be a year from now. Well, not quite exactly a year again, it's lunar, but anyway, it's not considered a feast. And as we're going to see, John is dealing with it as the whole week rather than a single event on what we would call Thursday night, um, as, we will, as we will see. John 13, 27. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus had Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Now notice, buy what we need for the feast. Not a single supper, but for the feast. It is assumed the disciples would not have thought Judas was going to make preparations for the feast if the Passover meal itself was already over. Hence, this must be Nisan 13, not Nisan 14. But there is no reason to look at the meaning of the feast to the Passover meal only, especially because this had been prepared. I mean, that, there was special preparation because the, the supper was unique. It didn't make it the whole feast, but it was unique of everything else that was done during the feast because of the blood and, and what happened in Egypt and things like that. But there is no reason to limit the meaning of the feast to the Passover meal only, but to the entire feast of unleavened bread, which makes the statement consistent with the synoptics with the Synoptic Gospels, which is interesting to me before I read the next section. It's interesting to me that people will theorize that the Synoptic Gospels were all written before John, and then they'll theorize that John had no idea it was in the Synoptic Gospels. So Matthew and Luke are editing Mark, but John's clueless. John's doesn't know what's going on. Decades later, he didn't know what the other Gospels 
actually said? It's weird, but anyway. Uh, John 18, 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. So there's only two possible early mornings here. Uh, Nissan 15, 14 or 15. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Now, does eat the Passover mean simply the Paschal Supper? No, the term Passover is used eight times in John besides this instance, and each refers to the Passover festival, not simply to the supper. And so, if you forget that it's a whole festival, then it sounds like what John chapter 18, verse 28 is saying is, um, they didn't enter the governor's headquarters so that they could eat the Seder meal that night. So that would make this the 13th and then become the 14th at sunset. Um, because that would be going into a Gentile's place that would bring defilement. And so they're not going to do that. Um, but that's not what's being said. Uh, the term Passover is used eight times in John besides this particular instance. And each refers to Passover festival, never to the single supper itself. So if they went... In, so let's put it this way. Let's say this was two days later, but still during the Passover festival. The same thing would happen. Because they would not be able to eat the rest of the Passover because they'd have to be separated because they're defilement. See? So, um, notice Second Chronicles 30, verse 22. So they ate the food of the festival for how long? Seven days. Seven days. So any defilement during that period of time would interrupt the ability to participate in the festival. Since this comment is made early in the morning, this must mean the festival, not the supper alone, is meant as any impurities would pass away at sundown. So think about that. It's another reason that particular text has been used to support the idea that John's going a day early, but the fact is that, that the impurity would have passed away at sunset anyways. So they would have been able to partake even of the Seder, even if the Seder was that night. See? So it is the fact that it's a seven-day-long festival that is in view in John's words. John 19, 14. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. Now, what is important here, and uh, I'm not getting into this right now, and it would take a... I'd like to... I've, I've read articles and listened to presentations, and it's pretty complicated, but there is... Uh, a lot of discussion about what year this took place. Uh, you'll hear 30, you'll hear 33. Um, there is a lunar eclipse, I think in 33, that people try to connect to the darkening of the skies and all that kind of some fun stuff. And then there's the theory that there was a high pass, that, that there was a conjunction of holidays, so this was a special high feast. Now, obviously, the Sabbath day of any um, Passover um, is going to be uh, a high, high day, but that there was a special situation here. We don't know what year it was. You can you can speculate, but there just isn't any way to nail it down quite that tightly. It'd be nice to do that. Maybe they'll discover something someday that might shed some more light. I don't know. They're always digging around Jerusalem. I mean, it's amazing that place doesn't just go from all the digging around they've they've done in there. Uh, but um, here's the point uh, on this. When it says it was the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour, um, the term f for preparation is paraskue 
in Greek. And yes, it means preparation. But if you ask a Greek, even to this day, what to, to name the days of the week, you know what Friday is going to be? Parascue. It's just the, it's the Greek word for Friday. And this is where it came from. Um, so it's saying now it was Friday of the Passover. <laughs> that's, that's what it's saying. So it's the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath day is Saturday. So it's Friday. I mean, the text says this happened on Friday. And this is right before the crucifixion. So when was Jesus crucified? He was crucified on Friday, the Friday before the Sabbath day of the Passover week, uh, and rose Sunday morning. So that is Friday of Passover week. It's, it's straightforward. It's clear. But most people are not aware because, see, we don't call Friday preparation day, parascue, um, but they did in Greek. And it was because of this very issue right here. John 19, 31, since it was the day of preparation, in other words, since it was Friday, and so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, so it's the Sabbath, the Passover week, therefore, this is preparation day, it's the Friday before a high Sabbath. Uh, the Jews asked Pilate their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. And so, straightforward statement, straight up and down, um, this took place on Friday. Uh, that is the specifics. Every day of the festival was a high day, including the Sabbath of the festival. Uh, this does not mean the first day of the festival coincided with the Sabbath, altering the timeline. So we see that John is in harmony with the synoptics on this matter. Uh, it has been a it just simply a bad assumptions at certain points. And then an ignorance of how the Jews count time. Not only hours in the day, sixth hour, twelfth hour, ninth hour, third hour, six hour difference between Romans and Jews, um, but the any portion of a day is a full day in Jewish thought. And so the audience that originally would have heard Jesus' teaching on the sign of Jonah would never have understood why modern people and why Muslims get all in a tizzy um, about this subject. They would have gone, no, we, we get it. Any portion of the day, full day, three days, three nights, we get it. You have to become a fundamentalist literalist to miss the point of what's being said at that point. Um, it is the usage that existed at that time that determines the meaning of the word, not one that develops at a much later point in time. So remembering that the Passover is an entire feast, how the Jews kept time, no reason to uh, assert that John is unconcerned about history and has decided to change things around. But again, I'll tell you right now, I would, I would predict the majority of commentaries on John written in the past 50 years won't even bother to give the harmonization. If you want to see someone else harmonizing the exact same way, A.T. Robertson's Harmony of the Gospels, one of the appendices has the same information in it. And that's been around, when did you write that, the 30s? Maybe 1930s, maybe earlier. I forget. 